You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host. My mission on my podcast is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaway from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else that podcasts are available. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote coaching as well as gratitude keynote speaking. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguide.com. And also, as you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguidepodcast.com. And I'll have contact information in the show notes after this episode. So, so let me get on with the show and introduce you to my guest. Uh, always a favorite part of my podcast is my guest and no exception today, a very, very special guest. This is my youngest son, Connor Brooke that is joining us. And so let me tell you a little bit about Connor. Connor was born and raised by his father and along with his brother in the Pacific Northwest. And in 2013, he relocated to the San Diego area to earn his bachelor's degree in business finance from San Diego uh, State University in 2018. In his spare time, he enjoys reading, surfing, hiking, running, and trying out new coffee shops something that the Seattle area was just famous for. And in, in 2018, Connor joined Frito-Lay as a sales associate in the San Diego area after his degree. And within his first year, he took on several special assignments, including backfilling newly created DSM roles and the San Diego Super DTS transformational change. So he continued on. And then in 2020, Con, uh, Connor transitioned to a super DTS large format DSL, a lot of acronyms here, through strong education, execution rather, of priorities and communication. Connor's led his team to be part of a number one, the number one team in 2021 for sales and so forth. He further expanded his leadership in the West region and also in the SD zone by taking on SME roles. We'll have all the acronyms at the end, by the way in case you're wondering, for Vaughn's, uh, Albertson's, uh, Marketing Hispanic, and the Equal ERG. Uh, finally, being a Quest coach, he has helped many people to be uh, uh, coached up to their next positions in his area. And then recently, he was promoted to key account manager and moved to Sacramento, California. So he's getting a little closer to me, uh, coming from all the way from Seattle down to San Diego and now to Sacramento. So who knows where his next promotion will be. Connor, welcome to the podcast. Oh, that gratitude guy. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, splitting the difference. Almost back to Seattle. We're getting there slowly but surely. And and for everyone that's listening, my apologies. I know there is a lot of acronyms, but uh, like my dad said, I will put them at the end. I know it was a little confusing when we start talking about that kind of lingo. Yeah, I think every business seems to have that. So many times I ask my podcast guests, how did we first meet? And uh, you and I first meet, you and I first met rather when you were born back in 19, uh, May 16th of 1994. So rather than talk about how we met, talk a little bit about your growing up experience in the Seattle area, uh, just kind of your choice, maybe not as much grade school and junior high, but junior high, high school, maybe how was that experience for you? Yeah, great question. So I think compared to like, I don't know how everyone else's experience growing up was, but, you know, I was very fortunate to have a very loving father and, you know, the one that's I'm obviously talking to right now, always very supportive, no matter what I did, all my decisions growing up, whether it be sports or school, always had a very good backing from my dad. Uh, unfortunately, um, I know my dad maybe has talked to some of the podcast, but my mom unfortunately lost her life when I was about four years old, which at a time or my brother was 14, my sister was 16. It was a very... We had a really good family up until that point until she passed away, but it definitely put a little turbulence on the family uh, where things were kind of a little bit shaky just because whenever you have such a huge monumental death, like, you know, somebody like my mom, and you know, for my dad, for his wife, that it put a lot of, a lot of strain on the family. And especially for myself being at a young age, I know from about a young age, from about four to six, I was in something called the GG's, a grief group. And I remember this having so many times I'd go to my dad, just ask him where my mom was. And I just did not understand fully of like what was going on. And. Just remember being so hard, but thankfully that 
I got put into a situation where I was able to interact with other kids where it made it a lot better to uh, understand the kind of grief I was going through and it made it like much more easier to digest than having to go through it myself. So I remember a couple of years kind of growing up like that. Once my mom died, it was definitely very troublesome trying to get my own uh, footing for myself. Even so much so that I remember actually in first grade, I actually got held back too, just because I just was so kind of lost. My dad and I were kind of moving from house to house. It was just kind of very tough um, from that aspect. Um, was never very enjoyable. Kind of growing up too, I was always never the most coordinated or sought after kid in sports. I remember from, you know, from my age, from anywhere from like four to 14, that if you ever, like if anyone that plays baseball on this podcast is like that, if you're, you know, there's nine people batting on the team, I was always number nine. Uh, I remember playing baseball every time the worst position you ever want to play was right field. I was always in right field. And I remember just so many times like where I just was always like, oh, here comes Connor Brook up to bat, you know, here we go again. And just always getting really, you know, always so tough with already my mom passing away, but always getting really down on myself in sports and not being the best. And uh, luckily, you know, after enough perseverance kind of growing up and having good support from my family, just enough working hard and hard and slowly, but surely kind of slowly moving the ball and kind of getting, you know, making like small inches, you know, I had to make huge leaps just as a kid and, you know, finally got my stride and, you know, started playing well in sports, started to start, you know, finally started doing well in school and just kind of never giving up to, but for a while at the start of my childhood, it was definitely very tough at a young age with everything that was going on. Well, that's a lot of information. I really appreciate that kind of all packed in together. So let me just uh, go back a little bit. I made some notes here. Talk about a little bit about the grief group. I think you mentioned that. I remember that very well. Uh, was the was the best aspect of that just the other kids had gone through the same thing? Or what was this biggest part of that that really impacted you back? Because that was when you were around four or five years old. Uh, what was the biggest part of that that really impacted you? Yeah, I think just having other kids that went through the same thing. I think as a kid that you think that this is all, this is only happening to me. And I think you kind of sometimes get like lost in your own head. Obviously, this is back 20 plus years ago before, you know, social media and other kinds of uh, technology aspects that we have. So I think before just kind of talking to myself and kind of getting my own head, but seeing other kids that, you know, they lost their dad in war, they lost both their parents due to, you know, a car crashing and seeing these kids openly show emotion and just being so raw, I think is a really good word to say of how they were feeling, kind of made me feel more at ease, even though it kind of sounds sad that seeing other people go through grief, but I was going through it too. And for us all to share in a safe space together. And I know that, you know, you always talk about going to whether it be finding gratitude, whatever it may be, what, you know, find what works best for you. And I can definitely say, I saw from a young age, you know, sharing your experiences with other people and sharing your emotion. It was just like such a huge, powerful thing and it helps you get over things too. So I saw a direct correlation, how it could benefit. Yeah. And I remember during that time, it was actually two weeks after your mom, my wife, Dana passed away. I went to a support group and I went for about a year and a half and very similar to the grief group for you, but yours with the course of the young kids, but just that shared experience. Uh, was so important to listen to people talk about it and for whatever reason or not for whatever reason but you figured out you're not alone so when you find people that have gone through similar things it just is it just makes it feel like gosh i've got somebody that understands and i used to comment on i noticed how many people when i talk would be nodding their heads and you felt wow here's somebody that kind of knows what i'm going through so that worked out being pretty well and 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 then next you mentioned about uh, being held back and i remember that experience and i remember very clearly talking to two or three of my good friends and, you know, no son of mine is going to be held back. And, and but you'd had a really difficult time losing mom. And um, it was, you know, Kyle was 14 at the time, but you were four. And so as you look back on that, I remember once you even said, Dad, why did you hold me back? I remember that. So as you look back on that, how do you see that experience from the perspective of 27 year old looking back now? Yeah, that's a great question. I think from 27, going back all the way back to when I was first grade, I just remember it just seems like it seems like such a great decision. It honestly worked out so well. I actually enjoyed being a year older than everyone else. It kind of sounds kind of silly, but when I turned mm. 16, I could drive before everyone else. When I turned 21, I could drink before everyone else. So like go out to the different, like I felt like I had a little higher stuff on everyone when I was, um, you know, looking back from 27 back to that point. But going back to first grade, Connor, what well, did not feel that way. I remember kind of feeling kind of, kind of like an outcast or just kind of felt kind of like, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of like a loser. I'm like, oh man, the first grade and, just like this at that time where that is like your whole world is like, you know, what, like you're just, your whole primary goal is to go to school. It was like really tough at that point too. But I think after a couple of years of kind of really, you know, dedicating, my, dedicating myself to school and just like reading, writing more, doing more sciences and just like really focusing on the core aspects of school that I found a really good support cast of students that I could felt like could be my friends. And then it kind of became obsolescent after a while. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I remember that too, because I think that it was a really tough decision when I remember talking to my friends and no son of David Brooks going to be held back, but it was interesting how it turned out to be a really great decision for any of the listeners or viewers out there that ever have had to struggle with that. I think when you look back, you can see kind of like Steve Jobs said, connecting the dots backwards, why things worked out the way they're supposed to. And it really did work out the way they're supposed to. And it, it didn't hit me till, gosh, you were probably 16 or 17 or 18 or somewhere in there when it just, I mean, I just remember it was 10 years or 12 years, whatever it was after that, when it hit me that, oh my God, I get an extra year with my son because normally he would have been graduating this year. And then you say the next year before you headed down to San Diego, which we'll talk about in a second. But I just remember that the moment that hit me and I thought, oh my God, it's like an extra bonus year. And you and I are so close that it really spoiled me. And it was ultimately, which we'll talk about in a minute, very tough for me to say goodbye to you to go down to San Diego for school. But, but before we get to that, uh, something that's very pivotal and you touched on, it, and I want you to expand on a little bit is the baseball experience. And I tell a story, as you know, in my keynote talks about your baseball experience, but uh, which we may or may not touch on, but talk, talk a little bit about, I think maybe what would be more valuable to the listeners than anything else is through that time of batting ninth and right field and, and uh, the last person in the dugout to bat or whatever, what maybe most importantly of all, what was it that just kept you going? Where do you think that came from? As your father, I was very supportive. He was most supportive as I could be, but still it was in you that really kept it going. What do you think was the, the drive or the, the consistency or whatever it was that just kept you pushing uh, to when we'll talk about what happened when you finally got into high school in terms of baseball and student of the year and things like that. But, but what was the thing that kept you going through all that? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I think like looking back is that it's easy for me to say now, like, oh, is this easiest not to give up? I just kept on pushing. But looking back at my younger self, I think that no matter like when I like as many times as I fell down, I think I just understood from a young age that I had to keep on pulling myself up. I knew that I think after my mom passing away that I knew that I had no choice, but I've already seen like the whole bottom. I've already seen like, here's where it's really bad. Here's 50 feet below that. And I've already been there. I've already seen so, seen it so bad. And honestly, being bad at sports, I was like, oh, you know, just if I kept on, I just kept on thinking to myself, if I keep on showing up, this will get better. And I don't honestly know where that really came from, but for whatever reason, I just kept on showing up and like, no matter how many times I struck out, no matter how many times I dropped the ball, no matter how many times people laughed at me when I messed up, for whatever reason, I just kept on showing up and like, this is going to get better. This is going to get better. And I think obviously having a great support, support pass in my family and everyone around me was extremely beneficial. But for whatever reason, I don't know why it happened, but I'm very thankful for that. And I think it's a really good, you know, thing to look back on, especially at 27, especially whether I have kids or, you know, coaching people at younger ages is that half the battle is just showing up, especially nowadays in 2021. And it's just so easy to get caught in like thinking I have to be the best of this. I have to be the best. You know, you don't have to be, it's okay. It's, that's not a very practical view of looking at things, but just showing up and finding the right people that are going to support you and just being okay with learning how to fail. It's okay. Yeah. Well, and I think a big factor there too is as you grow up, social media became more and more of a player and gosh, this is why I always said, I don't think Facebook should be called Facebook. I, I think it should be called look at me and just the whole thing that it does about the pressure that it puts on people and so forth. And, but uh, touching back on baseball real quickly, I would, I would say to audiences, sometimes when I was telling them the story about you coming up through the ranks and I said, he couldn't really hit, he couldn't throw, he couldn't catch, he couldn't run. Other than that, he was pretty good. And so yeah. it was like, <laughs> as you got better and you stuck with it at the batting cages and the fielding and so forth. And then uh, you probably won't tell the story, but is that you went on and there was a famous day that you got the game winning hit, which I talk about in my keynotes. And, but I think as importantly was to end up playing baseball and into high school and being the leadoff hitter. And then ultimately the same thing about an assessment I had on you when you were about five or six years old. And the lady said to me, I'll never forget it. She said, went through this six or eight hour assessment of what's wrong with Connor. And in the end, she says, he's not going to make it in this world. And I've told that story to people before. And they've said, um, can you find her? Can you figure out where she is? So you can go smack her or something, <laughs> not smack her. We wouldn't do that, but, but it just was, I just remember that. And I was just crushed and I started crying in the car and you went, what's wrong, dad. And I went, Oh, nothing. I think I just have something in my eye, but I had just been told that my son was going to make it in life. And so as you go on to become the leadoff hitter on the baseball team and get elected student of the year, I have the certificate right on my wall here at, um, uh, the high school, um, 
at right. Skyview Junior High School. And that was just so terrific because you were so, thought to have a learning disability. And so I think that really sticking down with it and or sticking with it rather is such a key point. And, and you said earlier too, something about getting down on yourself. Can you think as you look back on that, anything that somebody listening that could maybe help them, you mentioned a couple of things that could help them to keep from getting down on themselves or when they are getting down on themselves, ways to snap out of it. Yeah, and I think this is, you bring up a really good topic. I think this is extremely relevant right now as, you know, depression and suicides and stuff are at such a huge all-time rates, especially in 2021. So some things that, you know, I can't always express what's going to help best for other people, but I can tell you what works best for me and kind of maybe can draw some, some comparisons and you can take, you know, what works for you. But I found that consistency over time is definitely going to be your best friend of how you're going to be able to, I guess, most be well equipped to fight things that are going to cut you, you know, down on yourself or, you know, be extra hard on yourself. So some things I like to think of is like working out, whatever your method is, whether it be walking, you know, whether it be running, lifting weights, crawling, you know, by whatever means, you don't have to go fast. Just go like this, this go like, you know, move your body a little bit, 30 minutes to an hour a day, I think is so important. Finding some kind of way to keep on educating your mind. I think that an idle mind is a place for the, uh, the devil's playground, just because if we're not learning, then we're dying honestly. So I think whether you like read or whether you want to, whether you're like, you'd like to write in a journal, like my dad obviously has his gratitude journal, which I'm a huge proponent of as well. Just finding some kind of method where you're always exercising your brain, whatever it may be, whether it be an education system to journal, whatever it may be. Um, and also I'm a huge believer in meditation as well. Finding some kind of place to start be like kind of quiet. Ideally, I think the start of the day is like the most beautiful time of the day because it's like your most enjoyable time for yourself. A lot of studies and myself included, I like to think of like, you know, the five to 6 a.m. range, like waking up, like when no one else is awake, that kind of peace and quiet time before, uh, you know, work, finding that time where you can find your meditation, like reading for yourself is just so important because a lot of us, myself included before, would just like roll out of bed, seven, eight o'clock, look at my phone, look at social media, 30 minutes to an hour a day, and then go start my job, you know, I'll go hop on my laptop. I mean, what, what, what kind of messages are we sending to our brain right away when we do that? So I think, you know, obviously finding good, healthy moments, you know, obviously we're not, everyone's going to be able to like wake up at three or four in the morning every day and like go like work out, like, you know, a couple hours and go straight to work. Then maybe you have kids, but you just got to find a system that works for you because we all have 24 hours in the day. You just got to find a way to make them work somehow. Yeah, that's really good. And I know that I recently uh, put together a LinkedIn article that was called uh, starting today with your power hour. And it was basically, I found myself similarly to what you said, Con, I found myself looking at the cell phone before I even got out of bed, turning on the laptop before I even had my first glass of water and so forth. And I put this together that you want to, it really, it's a treat to yourself. And however you break that down for me, it's that first hour is 10 minutes or 15 minutes getting up first, having a big glass of water, making my bed, taking my shower, shaving, getting ready, then coming into the kitchen, turning on the lattes, having my vitamins and my green juice and so forth. And then going in to spend 10 minutes, five minutes to 10 minutes with my gratitude journal, and then 15 minutes to meditate, and then 15 minutes for stretching and maybe end up with a downward facing dog. And that's, that's an hour. And then I turn on the computer and then I look at the internet, and then I look at the phone and so forth. So uh, really, really powerful. And I just wrote that down, some of this consistency, working out, uh, meditation, gratitude journal, getting up at five or 6 a.m. Uh, certainly, I know you well enough too, and that's eating healthy. I'm going to add because I know that how healthy you eat and you're very much aware of the what you put in your body and that old line, you are what you eat, which I always kind of liked. But uh, I'm gonna, I want to talk about San Diego in a second, but just one more touch on from your perspective, because you're right in this demographic. What, what's your thought on the whole social media thing about how it can be used effectively or ineffectively or the good or bad? Or, well, how would you advise somebody when you talk about social media? Because you've gone through it now as part of your growing up, and it's really big in the last 10 years. But how do you think that's impacted you and any thoughts you might have for somebody with wondering what you think about it? Yeah, social media is a kind of a complex thing. I think it obviously has the goods and bads, and I think anything can be abused quite easily if we're not monitoring it. I look at, especially when we're not talking about not monitoring, monitoring, monitoring it with like, you know, younger kids, especially like in high school, junior high, you know, we let these young kids, young, you know, soon to be young adults have these multiple hours on social media and we're not monitoring it. Like we do like other, like TV and other things. And sometimes we forget, like it can be like really hard on a child's brain, constantly comparing themselves to other people. You know, if you look back at previous times, like we were not meant to always be constantly comparing ourselves to other people. And the reason I bring up younger kids into this conversation is that 
just like looking back at that when I was in my or in my teenage years, like 15 years ago, that I was never on social media and I found myself a pretty happy life because I was outside on my bike, you know, enjoying outside being around. Uh, that being said, you know, the way that things are shifting, that social media is not going to go away. So how do we find ways to cope with it? Well, I think just making sure that you monitor like what kind of stuff you're putting to your feed and like when you look at the stuff that does pop through your feed, just making sure that you're following people that follow the, the image and vision that you want yourself to go forth. So for example, if like I want to embrace a life of happiness and gratitude, then I probably shouldn't be following people that are probably partying till two or three or four in the morning and doing things they shouldn't be doing, you know, not being good Christians or being good people. So yeah. I think you need to have a direct feed of exactly what you want for your social media. Uh, for myself, for my personal stance, I I'm a very limited user. I just, I find myself just not really enjoying the kind of person I am on social media. I'm very lonely involved, but I do understand the importance of getting to see what my friends, if like someone's getting married or, you know, my, one of my, someone in my family's having kids, I get to comment on that. That kind of stuff is nice too, but I'm on the lower, uh, lower level of being involved. I think it's, uh, I've often made a comment in talks about how when I've gone to senior centers to do my gratitude talk and I try to find some of the oldest people and ask them, what is your advice? And one of the things I hear more than anything else is everything in moderation. And so that just somehow feels that that might be applicable with social media. That's I get talks through social media. I post articles about gratitude and things like this, but some of the other things are just so hurtful and that not as much for me, but for people where there's bullying and cyberbullying and all these things, which there's a negative side of that, which is, is really sad. So, so moving up to about 2013 is very pivotal time in your life when you made a decision to leave the Seattle area and go to San Diego for school. So uh, tell the listeners a little bit about that and how you made that decision and how that came about. Yeah, well, obviously when I was here 2012, 2013, looking to go to college and I was, I was a decently academic student. I, you know, I did decent in school, did it like, okay, my SATs, but for whatever reason that when my friend and I at the time, uh, we wanted to like look outside of Washington just because we kind of get, get out of the rain and kind of depressing weather. And anyone that's from Washington this call, I think you can relate to, you know, eight to nine months of rain definitely can wallow on a kid, have my games being rained out. So I never really enjoy that. Have my head down all the time. Like, you know, you're just walking like your head's angled mm -hmm. like as you're getting pelted with rain. So for whatever, for whatever reason, uh, my friend and, and I decided to go take a look down in Southern California, just like at this whole kind of surfer image, kind of beautiful weather. And we started touring around campuses down there. I saw like, well, like a good chunk of like five, five to 10, four year campuses for Southern California. And after going through multiple campuses, for whatever reason, the San Diego State campus was just really awestruck me too. And one of my dad's good family friends, Mark Caton, he's actually been on this podcast previously. I've stayed with him before down in San Diego when I was a uh, probably 10, 15 years ago when I was pretty young. And I just remember always as a kid, like, wow, San Diego would be a cool place to be. And, you know, for my visit, visits there, going to school there, for whatever reason, my my mindset just got kind of completely got shifted there. Uh, he was the only person I knew there, had no family there, uh, didn't know anyone besides him. And when I finally started looking at four-year colleges, when I looked at San Diego State and how much it would cost out-of-state tuition, we were looking even back, was it six, seven years ago when I first started going to college, we were talking about 30000 out-of-state tuition. And you know, I never wanted to take that much debt on. And I, you know, with my grades, I didn't think it'd be the easiest option. So I figured that I found a local community college. And after talking to enough people around the area and doing enough research, I found out that if you, you know, do a good two to three years at a local community college, get in-state tuition, you would save about 60 to 70, 60 to 70% of the money that you would instead of going to straight there. So with that in mind, I found, uh, you know, apartment close by and my friend and I moved down there straight after high school. I grinded really hard for about three years. Um, and community college to get enough grades to make sure I can transfer to San Diego State. And uh, after a couple of years there, this, you know, I always get a lot of questions like, oh, you must be ready to come back to Seattle after going to San Diego State, especially after transfer. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to stay in California probably. I like it down here. But that's just me, but it's, that's not for everyone. <laughs> and I've asked you uh, many times, and so I'd love to have you tell the listeners, what are you proudest of? And I know there's many, many things, of course, but what's at the kind of at, the, at or near the top of the list? And what do you all say about moving away? Yeah, no, that's, that's an easy one for that one. It's just, I remember, you know, graduating high school, everyone else is like staying around and like either like Washington, some people go out of state too, but a lot of people are still kind of close to home. And for myself and my friend to go like move all the way down to San Diego, it's, you know, it's about a two and a half hour flight away, you know, 20 hour drives, a 20 hour drive away to go down there, live by myself, you know, how, how do I start paying bills? You know, how do I start, you know, working full time while I'm going to school, I'm working full time and full time during community college at Costco actually. And just figuring out for myself the how do I, how I can like carve my own life out for myself because 
when a lot of us are stuck to, close to home, you know, it's unfortunate. I got to be away, you know, a lot of spend a lot of time away from my dad and my brother, which is very definitely dif uh, difficult. But going down there and finding a way to like make make it work for myself through everything and juggling all these balls at once made me like really self efficient of how, you know, because I had definitely had my own trials and tribulations of trying to make it by myself. It was not always easy, but at the end of the day, just kind of like the baseball story, I kept on getting up and figuring it out. And being that far away, I had no choice just like sports, like where I had to figure out like, hey, there is no option. I am not going back. I'm going to figure this out. I might not have a lot of money right now. How can I make some extra money? Uh, my grades are kind of slipping. Okay, don't worry. Let's start, with, let's start going to the tutor. Like, you know, no, there is no one behind me, like my like my parents or, or like, you know, close friends from high school to like really help me kind of like push me through that. So just like kind of that mindset, just like carving my own life out and just making it work was definitely the biggest thing. Yeah, and I was thinking you reminded me of Costco because you had a job at Costco up here and then you transferred down, I think, El Cajon, if memory serves. And because you basically worked in sometimes multiple jobs, but all through that college experience, you know, through the couple of years at Grossmont and then going to San Diego State for a couple of years and graduating. And, and of course, I, I'll try not to mention the time at the airport when I dropped you off in 2012 or 2013 when your dad couldn't stop crying as I'm sitting in the terminal waiting to fly back to Seattle. So that was an emotional time for me. It still gets me choked up sometimes at my. I was, I, I was going to say the listeners from saying that, you know, I don't want to, you know, call you off for that one. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of that. So it's, yeah, that was tough because it was, uh, we're so close and it was tough to know all of a sudden you're going to be 1300 miles away or uh, what have you down there, but it worked out extremely well. And then as you graduated and then you transitioned into, it's a great segue because a, a good experience and you did very well at San Diego State and graduated, which I'm extremely proud of you and your brother and your grandparents and, and various people are all very proud of you. And certainly Mark Caton, we mentioned him a couple of times as kind of your San Diego father and a very close friend of mine. And a number of other buddies of mine have kind of been extra fathers for you for not having a mother for so uh, uh, so much of your so many of your years and things. But so then let's kind of transition and and um, we'll probably maybe go another five ten minutes. But I want to get the listeners to follow this sort of course or journey of yours. Is talk a little bit about the job fair and then free to lay and then kind of how that worked because that's quite an interesting story. And as your dad, I'm extremely proud of you. I tell you that all the time about the journey that you took after graduation, not only graduating and but I'm being told years ago that you have a learning disability and you're not going to make it in this world and all this. And now you move away and then you graduate from an ex extremely fine university, San Diego State University, and then you go to a job fair. So take it, pick it up from there and tell the listeners kind of what happened next. Yeah, so this is like around 20, like year 2017 going to year 2018. I remember, obviously, I, like my dad was saying, I was always like working some kind of job, if not full time, either, either part time during most of my school career, whether it be from Costco. I also worked at the newspaper, running the uh, advertising department for the newspaper. Uh, I also used to do like landscaping on the side. So I'd always be, uh, be working a lot too. So for that being said, that I didn't spend a lot of extra time doing a kind of internship or something that's kind of geared towards a business field necessarily. I guess I did have an accounting job for a year, but I found out I did not like accounting. I was actually an accounting major than I switched to finance because I did not like accounting. No number country for this guy too. I'd rather be the face for sales or something like Pepsi, which I'll get into in a second. But I just I just knew that going into my senior year, I was like, wow, I don't like have a lot of practical work experience for what I want to do, which I really didn't even know at the time. Uh, from the, so that being said, that now, most of the people I was going to my senior year with, no one really knew what their job was going to be. They didn't have a really job locked down. And I remember one of my professors at the time in one of my finance classes saying, hey, there's a career fair going on this fall. We have all these big, big companies. We've got like Deloitte, uh, you know, all these big finance companies. We had Pepsi, uh, Dairy Gold, all these people like looking for managers or like entry level positions, like straight out of college. I was like, wow, I never really thought about that. Then my best friend from college, one of them, uh, his name's Peter. And I decided that we were both business finance majors together and we decided to go to this career fair and going around the career fair. I was like hanging out the resumes, always trying to schmooze someone to try to kind of get a job from them. And for whatever reason, uh, when I was at Pepsi, I was just always so blown away. They're talking about like, yeah, in your first year of the company, you'll be leading a $10 million business. You'll have 17 direct reports. You learn from the bottom and kind of work your way up. Uh, you'll get like, you know, start like a kind of a a medium wage, but within a couple of years, you'll make a, you know, very good living for yourself, especially in your, like, you know, your mid to late twenties. And for whatever reason, I don't know why it really stuck out to me, but the guy, uh, for whatever, you know, Peter and I decided to both interview for this job. And the guy that interviewed us is actually both our current, actually our previous territory manager that both managed us. And he was like in a different role before. So it's kind of funny. It came full circle because he made a really big impression on us. 
and we go through this kind of whole process of getting interviewed for Pepsi. Uh, you know, it's about three or four interval, three or four you know, interviews, like panel interviews, and we both get the job. And we both we got really fortunate because with a big job, uh, big corporation like PepsiCo, uh, FLNA, which is Frito Lay North America, it's not always so easy to get a location like San Diego. But we were both fortunate. You know, the cards were in our favor. We both got chosen to be in San Diego, and we're lucky in that in that regard. And uh, for a whole year, this whole thing for Free to Lay and talk about a grind is that uh, when we have an offer in my senior year, it was like around November, December time that I signed a contract to work start the following September with Free to Lay. And um, that way, uh, for my, all my, the rest of my senior year, for my spring semester and going into the summer, I already knew what my job was going to be, which gave me a huge leg up over other, um, other classmates that didn't know what they were going to do. So anyone that is still in college or, you know, a little bit younger on the call that I, if I can urge you to go on a career for, uh, go to the career fair or sign up with a company prior to uh, graduating, giving you graduation day, I highly recommend because it gave me such a peace of mind to just focus on school. And afterwards during the summer, I actually went on like a six, a six week whole tour of like Europe with my friends. And it felt like really reassuring to know that I came back and like, hey, I already have a job taken care of for me. So I would definitely love to press that on anyone that is in that kind of field looking to try to find a job afterwards as well. Then real quick on the free to lay North America asp uh, asp uh, aspect is that for my dad said about for being a sales associate, sales associate that's basically like you're a fast track manager from uh, year zero to one of how you're going to get this $10 million, $10 million business and manage these like 15 to 20 people. And the whole point of it is, is that they're actually from a big company like Pepsi and amongst other big companies are encouraging you to get business related degrees. So mine was business financing me any business uh, business degree. But since you have a business degree, you can fast track this whole manager process, which would usually take someone in the company 15 to 20 years working from like a sales, like a sales route, like driving a truck for like um, a DSD, which is direct to store, another acronym, acronym where you have to have all this work experience. But since you have that business related field, you can do it in a short, uh, short uh, span from only one year. So for this, the we'll wrap this up real quick on the free to lay aspect. But one thing I found really interesting in that is at free to lay, you had to stop directly uh, directly from the bottom. So what that mean, means is that if you ever see like the big, you know, 30 foot trucks of free to lay or like, you know, any like the 20 foot uh, trucks that say free to lay is that these people, uh, you know, we call route sales representative RSRs, but like go to the, go to warehouse every morning, go grab a handheld for like ordering product, go like load up other product and go like go deliver direct to store. And these are people you'd be managing for this whole first year. And it's a really cool process of like where for this first six weeks of when you're first starting, you actually train with someone working up at these crazy hours, two to three, four in the morning and go work with them together. And you'd be, you know, work for 12, 13 hours. It's usually built up, built up a 10 hour work day. Then afterwards you do that for six weeks with them. You get certified with that manager. Then you do another six weeks by yourself of where you're running the route by yourself. And let me tell you, it's really tough being, you know, your mid twenties post college, seeing people out of the bars, and you're like, uh, like on a Friday or Saturday, you have to go run this route, and you have to wake up, you know, as they're going to sleep, you're waking up to go run a route. So I remember being like, oh man, it's kind of, it's kind of tough right now. But it, what a cool experience, and I just, I'm so appreciative to a job like uh, PepsiCo for Free to Lay for doing that because when you're managing and leading these groups of people on the front line for. It doesn't have, it can be anything, but my situation is for free to lay for direct to store for managing chips is that it gives you, builds you such empathy with your people and understanding of what they're going through. And it's a, such a cool process. And I'm like very thankful for that because a lot of people will discuss if you come straight out of college about, you know, starting from the bottom, it'd be really, uh, really hard to understand of like what their people are going through without being there with them, like every step of the way too. But that's just like a little flavor of free to lay. Well, and I think something that you mentioned too, that you and I have talked, we talk about this quite a bit, but we talked about it frequently, uh, recently rather, and that's this idea of there's different ways you can get to with the company and start asking about benefits and how quickly do I get promoted and when do I get a raise and when do I get to the next level and so forth, where you can get in there and just put your head down and work hard. And I've mentioned on the podcast before working 15 years for Nordstrom and getting eight promotions. And the key to Nordstrom is you never ask for a promotion. They promote you. And they just find out who are the people that are really making it happen and they pick you and you keep moving up. And that was just such a good reminder. And you've gotten two, three, four promotions and, and other aspects of your job that have changed. And speak to that just for a second or two about that. It's really comes down to one thing, just putting your head down, working hard and good things will happen. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think just always like, I think kind of like what I talked about previously, just always showing up and just like always being there no matter what, like, I'll you know, like, let's say, for example, like I've had store managers multiple yell at me for a multitude of things that people not showing up or service issues. And 
you know, one of the, whether it be a phone call or going to that store in person, I'm like, oh, this is not going to be a fun conversation. But you know what? Same thing as being a Nordstrom store manager. There's probably a lot of, you know, conversations you didn't want to have, but you had to have them. Right. So I think put, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations is key. Then not being afraid to ask for more uh, outside of your role. And like you said, it's always so funny. You're like, oh, well, when can I get promoted? When can I get, get, when can I get paid more? And one of the things I've like definitely learned, at least in a corporate job, is that you have to take other responsibilities that are outside your role and not be getting paid for them to put, get well far in advance. And just knowing that, it just you just keep on taking more and just showing that you can take on responsibility outside your realm to put you in good positions to get, you know, like you said, other promotions and to put you put your um, sphere of influence in other places to put yourself in a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just so important. I think that it's, it's really, and plus when you, we've talked, I've had different types of jobs where I started at the large, started at the bottom, started at the top. And yes, it takes time to start at the bottom and move up like Nordstrom and at the lows, for instance, I started at the top as a store manager. And frankly, I prefer starting at the bottom because as you say, you have empathy and appreciation for the people that work there. And, and so uh, just one more thing on Frito-Lay, and then we're going to start to wrap up here. Uh, talk a little bit about you just experienced a new thing about six months ago, and that is you got promoted, but also had to relocate. So talk about going from uh, the effect on you from going from San Diego to Sacramento. Yeah, it was uh, definitely very tough after, especially being in San Diego for about eight years, building my whole culture of all my friends from college, you know, all my colleagues together, my girlfriend, and, you know, all these like really close people I met in San Diego. I've definitely created a very good foundation of people that I've surrounded myself by in San Diego. And when I decided to take this promotion to from like a local district sales manager to a key account manager for helping support our Northern California market, it was really difficult because moving away from everything that I've been so used to kind of similar to when I left Seattle to come to San Diego and now like leaving that after so many years is not easy but I see that I know that the, some of the like most growth is like putting yourself in uncomfortable situations so when I think about moving myself up another 500 miles that's the, the difference between San Diego and Sacramento for you know a couple of years and maybe I go back a different area but just I love putting myself in uncomfortable situations and like making myself learn from like the beginning because that's like where you have the most like raw ability to keep on uh, building your foundation for yourself to keep on doing better things but it definitely wasn't easy but for right now like I'm enjoying being back to kind of it's kind of funny being back in the kind of like a rainy kind of colder weather after such such nice weather for so long it's kind of fun being back to something that's kind of more my element but it has its own uh, troubles but for the most part it is a really enjoyable experience and anyone that's afraid in their younger years to move whether it be for family or relationships, I, I definitely try to urge you to try it as much as possible if it is in your wheelhouse, because I think that there's definitely more regrets not doing it versus doing it as well um, will be like my one tidbit of advice. Yeah, and I think that it, I like the old line. I love there's a million cliches I like, like you can lead a horse to water, but can't make it drink and so forth. But I believe also sometimes you got to take a step back to take a few forward. And it's just sometimes a step back. Maybe that means relocation. Maybe it means doing a job you don't like as much. But as long as you're taking one back and two or three forward, it's kind of worth it. And so uh, I'm thinking, and then I've got one last question for you after this. Um, I'm thinking about some of the things you said earlier. And so if there's anything you want to add to this, but maybe somebody is listening that's your age or younger and is thinking, well, gosh, he's on a pretty good career path. And then what he went through for high school to college to now the job. And some of the things you said are consistency, uh, the working out piece, the exercise, the meditation, the gratitude journal, getting up at five or six and starting your day. Uh, I mean, I added eating healthy because I know that you are very big on that. Anything else you could add to that list for somebody as part of their routine to make sure they're on a good track? I think just also like I know I, I talked about a little bit previously, but it's like surrounding yourself with like really good people as well. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, especially friends or colleagues, whatever it may be. But I know this is kind of a little cliche as well, but you know, your five friends that are closest to you should be, you know, going places that you want to be. So I think just like having a really good support cast is like really important to making sure your it matches the vision and like mission of like where you want to go with your life. And it's okay if you don't know you, where you want to do at the end of your life. I honestly didn't know, like when I was back in college and I was going to work for Pepsi and I just still don't know what I want to do, but putting yourself in good frames and good situations to keep on, you know, putting yourself in a good, um, uh, Good mindset to keep on putting yourself in good things and positive things that could happen for yourself yeah and i think it's so uh, it's so true i i've always liked the line you're known by the company you keep and uh john lee dumas always says quotes the idea that you're you're the product of the five closest friends that you have and and it's just it's interesting and i think back about when i think about raising you I, want, I didn't have to pay a ton of attention to it, but it just it was enough that it was helped me, which is who are you hanging out with? Who are your friends? 
if you're hanging out with, with sketcher, sketchy type friends, as we always say, I would kind of wonder, gosh, maybe that's not too good. And let me be really aware of. And, and I still remember so clearly uh, taking you to some house to have a friend, to have a play date with a friend. And I talked to the parents and meet both of them and so on and, and see the house and make sure everything was really cool. And then the play date was at our house. And then some kid just knocks at the door and the parents haven't met me. They haven't called me. And they just, there's a kid, I'm here to play with Connor. And I go, don't they want to know I could be a, uh, an ax murderer, <laughs> you know, gosh. So it, it really is important how you're kind of, who you surround yourself with is so important. And another one I love around that is the better tennis player. So, so my last question is, it's always my favorite to end up every podcast with. And that is, I know there's multiple things, but if you can only pick one thing that you know today at 27 years old uh, that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you, what would that be? Just have a strong belief that everything happens for a reason and God has a plan. Strong belief that everything happens for a reason. That's very good. Uh, and God has a plan. God has a plan. Excellent. You know, and it's interesting too that surround yourself with positive people. It makes me think of, I've always liked the line, a rising tide raises all boats, but I noted recently, but you can't help somebody with a boat that has a leak in it. You yeah. know, so you're always going to want to hang around with those people that are, that are moving forward. Strong belief that everything happens for a reason and God has a plan. I mean, you can try plugging the holes, so it's not sure how long it's going to help you out for. <laughs> yeah, and that's, well, it's, it's, and I could go on cliches all day long. We've got to wrap up, but I've said many to my coaching clients that I'll be your training wheels, but I'm not going to pedal your bike. You know, you got to do the work. I think God gives you the toolkit, but I think you got to build the house. I think that's kind of how it works and stuff. Sure. So, well, Connor, my son, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And let me just wrap up by telling all the listeners uh, again, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Pacific Standard Time and the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating. Uh, if you would, I really appreciate that. And then I know there's a, a lot of people that are struggling with all sorts of life issues, especially post-pandemic. And so I have a program called my Gratitude Coaching Program that will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My six-month proprietary gratitude program is available to my podcast listeners and to the listeners. If you mentioned that this podcast is where you heard about it, you can get two extra months for free. And as I mentioned, it's the you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com and email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com as well. Also, if you'd like to receive my weekly Monday morning minute video, a lot of people like to get that every Monday morning at 6 a.m. You can go to your text and type in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and it'll send you a link and you could send in your email and you'll get that uh, in your email every Monday morning at six in the morning. So lastly, thank you so much, Connor. Thank you again. Thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate you listeners and viewers. And uh, as I always say, every single time, I'm David George Brooke, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.